Our text for our message today from the book of Jeremiah, a tale of two servants, Ibed Melech and Hamelech Zedekiah. And so we're uh, in the timeline where Jeremiah and Ezekiel parallel uh, one Ezekiel in Babylon and Jeremiah in Jerusalem, and the last king of Judah, King Zedekiah. So, chapter 38, verse 1 Sephathiah, Gedaliah, Juchal, and Pashur heard Jeremiah say, Thus says the Lord, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, but he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him, and he shall live. This city shall be given to Babylon. And so as we read that today, uh, and we look at it from the Bible perspective, and we look at uh, Jeremiah, and he's a hero to us, uh, a prophet of God, and we know that the prophecy that he gives here uh, came to pass. Babylon does come and does destroy the city, and we seen over and over again that everything that God told him to say that he said came to pass, right? And so he's our biblical, uh, a biblical prophet giving the word of the Lord, right? So we root for, for, for Jeremiah, and so he says this statement, and we say, yes, Jeremiah, that is truth. But now, if we were living there in Jerusalem and heard Jeremiah or someone saying these words, or if it was modern times and we were here in America today and we were under attack, right, because Jerusalem was under attack. Babylon had laid siege to the city. Their armies were outside and had it barricaded off and siege mounds set up. And so if we were here and, and we were under attack by some foreign nation and someone stood up and said, America is going to fall. We should surrender to the, to the other country, to the enemy. We should all give up. We should go and defect and join them. What would we say about that person? What would that person be labeled? Treason. It'd be a traitor. Exactly. That'd be treason. And, and treason is punishable by, by death. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, so yeah. So, we're looking at it. Yeah, Jeremiah, that was the right message, but not everybody heard it that way. And so, you have these four princes here who hear Jeremiah saying this, as well as other people. And so, they go. These princes said to the king, Please, very politely, please let this man be put to death, for he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city and the hands of all the people. This man does not seek the welfare of the people, but their harm. Right? And so now I think we can see their perspective. Right? Uh, they're looking at, and if they were godly at all, they were looking at the promises that had been given uh, by, to Abraham and, and to Moses and, and David. This is the city of God. God's presence is going to be here forever. God's eyes are upon this city. God will protect this city. We have nothing to fear. It doesn't matter how big Babylon is. It doesn't matter how bad they are. It doesn't matter the size of their army. God's going to deliver us. And here's this guy weakening the soldiers, weakening the people's resolve. People are, are defecting. People are leaving. Soldiers are giving up. The morale is down. And this is not good. He should be put to death. So that's their position. Jeremiah has been very consistent all throughout, giving his message publicly and openly, unafraid. So it puts the king in a very difficult position. So Zedekiah the king said, he is in your hand, for the king could do nothing against you. That's one of the things he's in your hand, okay, the law of states, and this is, you know, a, a form of treason, and being a traitor, and so, so yes, okay, arrest him. It's another thing for him to add on, I can't do anything against you. You guys are too powerful for me. I'm a weak and vacillating king, and, um, and you guys have more influence than I do, and so I can't do anything against you. He didn't have to add that part in, but he does anyway, and that tells us a little bit about him, and, and we'll see more as we've seen, and we see more regarding him. So the princes took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son. Now, I don't know what the king's son is doing with a, with a dungeon in his house. Uh, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes in the dungeon, and there was no water but mire, and Jeremiah sank in the mire. 
So this might not have been so much a prison dungeon as a well. And maybe a dry well or a drying up well. It doesn't have water in it. All that's left is some mud in the bottom. And so they put them down into this well. So now you get the kind of the, the shape and the size of what he's being placed into. Probably not even enough room to lay down if he could lay down. Who would want to lay down in the mud anyway? And so he's now sinking in the mud. And so it's coming up to, who knows, his ankles, maybe his knees. He's sunk in mud, standing in mud, uncomfortable in mud. And how long can he do that for before he's sitting in the mud, damp, wet, unsanitary, unclean, maybe disease, maybe mold, no fresh water to drink, no fresh food to eat. And this is the condition that Jeremiah is left there for him. And so not only these princes wanted him the death, and that's what they asked for, but they're looking for a slow, painful, starving, sickness type of a death to come upon Jeremiah. They don't want to just shut him up. They don't want to just do justice according to the law. They are bringing revenge and, 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 and discomfort and pain, a painful, slow death upon Jeremiah. And they leave him in this dungeon. Not a good situation. Now, through this, we don't hear Jeremiah recanting. I promise I won't, I'll, I'll be good. I won't say anything anymore. Just let me out of here. They let him down, tie ropes on him. He probably got rope burns from that experience, getting let down. And so now he's in pain and, and, um, and suffering. And I, I doubt they took him kindly and friendly out there. Might have dragged him and, or beaten him, uh, tossed him down into this well, this pit. Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. Ebed Melech said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil to Jeremiah the prophet. He is likely to die from hunger in the dungeon, for there is no more bread in the city. So the, the, the not like a state prison where they provide three meals a day, you know, or anything like that, and a soft bed uh, and a television set or anything like that. They, they, you'd have to have someone bring you bread. And even if Jeremiah had some friends, and we only know maybe one or so that's been mentioned so far, Baruch, um, that have stood with him faithfully, he doesn't have any bread to bring them, even if he could. The only people who have bread are those who have influence and money and power. And so he's very boldly, this man's going, Ebed Melech, and that's probably not his name. Ebed Melech means servant of the king. So it's really more description. A servant of the king who happens to be an Ethiopian, and he's a eunuch as well, and I doubt that was by choice. And so he very well could have been some type of a slave taken from Ethiopia under some kind of a trade deal or something, or he owed money to someone or something, and somehow gets sold through the rank, ranks and, and uh, is made into a eunuch so he doesn't try to escape and so that he's submissive and, uh, and he's a servant to the king. Now for him in that position, in that role, to come before the king and to call these princes, say what they're doing, call them out and say what they've done is evil, so not only just speaking on behalf of Jeremiah, but speaking against what these princes have done and how they're doing it and that they're starving him to death. That's enough in itself to get him in trouble. So he, with boldness, revealing wrong as well as pleading a case for right. And he's coming before the king to do that. Now that very well could get him killed. It can get him killed by the king just for coming and speaking in behalf of the king regarding a prisoner or a traitor. And then these princes aren't going to be happy. And he's not only speaking in behalf of Jeremiah, but he's speaking against them. So he's putting his life in danger, but he goes anyway, boldly, before the king. Meekly, meek, no, now, meekly and humbly, but with a boldness also. And that's what true meekness is. Boldness before men, 
weak before God, humble before God. And so he comes and pleads Jeremiah's case and asks for him to, to, to help him out, to take him out of the dungeon. And so while he's a eunuch and a servant to the king, he's really a servant of the king of kings. He's the true servant here. And we all serve someone. And he is serving, yes, the king, but he believes in Jeremiah. He doesn't call him just Jeremiah, but he calls Jeremiah the prophet. So he believes the message of Jeremiah. He acknowledges him as a prophet. He doesn't call him Jeremiah the traitor. And just speaking in his behalf, just out of humanity, well, we shouldn't, he shouldn't die that way. You know, he's a traitor, so we should just execute him, but not starve him to death in a wet, uh, damp, muddy uh, hole in the ground. Uh, but he calls him a prophet. And so he believes, he believes the message. And yet he comes before the king, risking his life and standing up for right and, and goodness. So the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, take 30 men with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. Now for the king to do that, that took uh, guts and, and, and boldness. So, so first he's saying, I can't speak against you and I can't stand against you, princes. But here now he's doing that and, and opposing them and standing against him. And it took a servant of the king to give him the courage to do what is right. And so he says, lift him out. Now he sends 30 men with him. Now either Jeremiah gained a lot of weight down there in that well, that it takes 30 men to lift him out, or the king knew that there would be opposition to this, and he wants to make sure that there's a good-sized contingency to protect and help uh, ebed Malik be able to pull this off. And if he's in the king's son's house, 30 men would be a lot, right? To get into that house and into that, wherever that well is, wherever room that would be. So he's got a lot of men in the house protecting and no doubt men outside, making sure that they get this done and pull this off and protect them. So the king now has taken a good stand. So he vacillated, now he's standing for right and gives ebed Melech what he needs to pull it off. Ebed Melech took old rags and let them down to Jeremiah and said, Put these under your armpits, under the ropes, and they pulled Jeremiah up out of the dungeon. And so now we see him, Ebed Melech, uh, doing what is right, standing before the king, speaking in behalf of Jeremiah, but now also showing tenderness and kindness and, and, and empathy towards Jeremiah and making sure that he's comfortable in coming up out of the, out of the dungeon. Uh, he might have been hurt and rope burns going down. He doesn't want that to happen coming up. And so uh, he looks around, what do we have available? And he finds some old rags and sends them down to Jeremiah. Sometimes we look around and we don't think we have enough. We don't have enough resources. And we have lots of excuses of why we can't be doing the work of God. We don't have the means, we're not in a position, we're just a eunuch, we're just a slave here, we're just a servant here, and we can get killed if we speak up, and there's more powerful people who would oppose us, and us getting what is right, we're just one voice, here's these four princesses, and, and we have the law against us, that he's a traitor, and, and, uh, and who are we to do anything? And I have nothing with me except some dirty old rags. God says, move forward in faith, trusting the Lord, the King of Kings, and he will bring it to pass. Use what we have. Don't wait for a better opportunity. Don't wait for a majority to get behind us. Don't have to necessarily send around a petition to, to see how many are in favor of this idea. If it's right, stand for the right and move forward with what we have at hand, in whatever position we're at, whatever abilities we have, and do what we can do. And that's what he does. He does what he does. He, can go, he goes before the king. The king gives him permission. And he gets these 30 people. And then he gets rags to do what he can. And a rope to bring him out. God's calling us. Be servants of the king. To help those in need. 
using the means that we have available to us. Our voice and whatever we have available in going forth and ministering to those around us. Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So he gets taken out, he gets put into prison, but the court of the prison. And Zedekiah had Jeremiah brought to him at the third entrance of the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you something, hide nothing from me. So here again, now we see the king, he allows him to get put in prison, a dungeon, and taken out, doesn't release him, but has him put in prison. So still siding somewhat with the princes. And yet going to him secretly and saying, tell me, hide nothing from me. What is the word of the Lord? What, what do you have to say? Tell me, I want to hear from myself. So he's going and he's seeking from Jeremiah truth. Jeremiah said, if I declare it to you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, will you not listen to me? Jeremiah is straight out, you know, no fear. Right? This is truly no fear. This is not just stupidity. This is not just brash. This is not just, uh, you know, out of anger. He's just telling the truth. You have, I've been speaking for all these years now. I've been given a consistent message from the Lord. You haven't listened thus far. What should I think you're going to listen now? Why do you want to hear it again? Won't this judge you trying to get me to try and entrap me? You want me to say it before you so you have evidence that I'm a traitor and, and, and speaking treason against you and against this city and telling people to defect to Babylon? Then you can put me to death? Is that what this is about? Or do you just want to hear it again and then you're not going to listen anyway? Right, Jeremiah could have said, well, King, what do you want me to say? <laughs> I'll say whatever that gets me out of this prison. Thank you for taking me out of the dungeon. Thank you for delivering me. I'm very hungry. And if you give me another piece of bread, I'll say whatever you want. It'll all go well with you, King. Whatever you want to do, it's a good idea. I'll back you on it. That's not what he says. Jeremiah knows he needs to speak the word of the Lord. God's truth doesn't change. God's truth is not up for discussion. Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, as the Lord lives, who made our very souls, I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hands of these men who seek your life. These are very real situations. Right? Ebed Malik had real people that he was facing, a real threat to go to the king. Could be his death, could be his imprisonment. Jeremiah is facing real people who can put him to death, real enemies there. We're not talking about, you know, just possibilities, but realities. Not just circumstantial fears, but real fears based on reality of who was in influence and who could do what they want to do and threaten to do. And the king's partner, don't worry, I won't turn you over. Jeremiah said, the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel says, if you surrender to the king of Babylon, your soul shall live. This city shall not burn with fire. If you do not, this city shall be given into the hands of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire and you shall not escape from their hands. So he just lays it out there. You got two choices, king. A right choice and a wrong choice. Surrender or don't surrender. If you surrender, he gives them a promise, he gives them hope, and he gives them a warning as well. Again, we see that consistently throughout the Bible. A promise and hope for doing what is right, and a warning and a punishment for doing what is wrong. Again, this doesn't sound like a message of the Lord. Why, was going to God allow, why would God allow the city to be destroyed? We have all these promises in the Bible of God's protection. But we also have 
from Moses and many other writers, warnings against turning from God. And if we turn from God, God promised also the warnings that the city would be destroyed and the people would be destroyed and we would be scattered among the nations. So Jeremiah is also speaking from prophetic instruction of the word of God because they were disobeying and were not following God. And so the end result is going to be the destruction. So he gives the king two choices. Serve the Lord and live. Surrender to the king of Babylon, like God is saying. Or note. And you're going to lose your life and lose the city. The city will be burned. Tough position puts the king in. Zedekiah said, I am afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans. At least they deliver me into their hand and they abuse me. Of all the things to fear, he's fearing the Jews. He doesn't say I'm fearing the four princes who, who, and, and, and my, soul, my, my commander in chief who don't want to give up the battle. I don't, I'm not fearing the, the king of Babylon who can kill me. I'm fearing rather the Jews who've already gone over to Babylon. who are not happy that we haven't surrendered earlier. who are not happy that we have resisted. who are not happy that, that the city has, people have been starving to death and that people have died in the battle and more. I fear that I'll be turned over to them and they'll abuse me. And that no doubt was a very real fear as well. As well as the four princes, as well as the uh, commander-in-chief of the army, as well as what, who knows what the king of Babylon would do to him. So he had some very real fears in front of him as well. But he has Jeremiah promising him, all's going to go well. Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak to you. So it will be well with you, and your soul shall live. So now we see Jeremiah going even the extra mile. All right, he gave him the message, he gave him the word of the Lord. Because the king asked for it, God impressed him to give it. But he hasn't given up. He's now pleading with the king for the king's sake. Now Jeremiah could have had a lot of reasons not to want to help out the king. The king hasn't been nice to him all along and caused lots of problems to him. He could have still been aching from being thrown into the dungeon. Things were still not great. He still was in prison. And we don't see Jeremiah in any of this conversation asked to be released from the prison. He's pleading for the king. Please obey the voice of, voice of the Lord and surrender to the king of Babylon. God needs to give us that kind of message. Not only a message of truth, but with love and a concern for the one we're giving the message to. Truth is good. And truth is fine. But truth without love is not so much truth. We can speak like the, the voice of men and of angels, but if we have not love, nothing but a tingling symbol, Nothing it needs to be accompanied with love. And that's what God gave to Jeremiah. It's miraculous. It's not in his own strength. God transformed Jeremiah. He had Melech to go before the king. That was miraculous. God did that in his life. God transformed him. And that's what God wants to do in us and through us. We face very real fears like the king is facing here. We have some very real decisions to make in life. To follow the Lord, which will bring again, against us opposition. Opposition from those who aren't following the Lord. Opposition from those who are professing to know the Lord. And yet are not following the Lord. Opposition from like the kings of Babylon who just flat out are not following the Lord. Opposition from those who used to follow the Lord, but who defected to the king of Babylon. Very real oppositions we face in following truth, following the word of God. Very real fears, like in the story Bob read earlier. 
We threaten with our job if we follow the Lord and keep the Sabbath. Very real fear is that if we give tithe and offering to the Lord, we won't have enough to make it the rest of the week, the rest of the month. How can we go further with less? It's very real fears. Maybe from our boss, maybe from our financial advisor, maybe from our spouse, maybe from our children, maybe from our parents, maybe from our friends work associates, people at school, people we know. If we let it be known that we're following the Lord, people in our neighborhood knew. People in our community knew. People at work knew our stance for the Lord. Would they treat us differently? How would they look at us? What would they say about us? Some very real fears, because it's not a friendly world right now. ebed Melech, a servant of the king, served the Lord God. Who is Zedekiah the king serving? Who is he going to serve? Being presented, follow the Lord and receive life. Your soul shall live. Work against the Lord and it won't go well with you, you will perish. Who's he going to serve? And the same question is for us. We're all servants to someone. We're either going to serve the Lord. What was it, uh, Bob Dylan? you got to serve somebody, right? <laughs> Whether to serve the Lord or serve the devil. Everybody's got to serve somebody. And either we're serving the Lord or we're serving self. If we're serving self, then we're serving the devil. If we're letting our fears get in front of us, we need to fear the Lord and not fear people, not fear circumstances, not fear situations, even if they're real fears. I'm not talking just imaginary fears, which is plenty of those, but real fears. Face the real fears regardless of the circumstances. Like an Ebed Melech, like a Jeremiah. Surrender the fears to the Lord. Surrender the selfishness. Accept the Messiah's sacrifice in our behalf. Let him forgive us. Let him transform us. Because we're all born serving self. That's how we are. That's our nature. To become like an Ebed Melech, to become like a Jeremiah, it's a miracle of God. It takes a transformation. It takes confession of sin and surrender to God, the true king. Allow him to remove the fears out of our minds and hearts, even if they're really still there physically on this earth. To remove the self, to remove the concern about our own welfare over God's truth. Accept his forgiveness, accept his sacrifice in our behalf, accept his cleansing, accept his Holy Spirit, accept his power to move forward boldly, following the Lord. Whether it means prison, Rejection, becoming a servant here on this earth, whatever it means to serve God, and to save our souls. If you refuse to surrender, this is the word that the Lord says. All the women, your wives and your children who are left in the king of Judah's house shall be given to the king of Babylon's princes and you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. Surrender, and you will save your soul. You won't be handed over to those who want to hurt you, but if you don't surrender, your wives, your daughters, your sons are going to be given over to the princes of Babylon. And the city is going to be destroyed. Whew. Heavy responsibility. It's coming down to one person's decision whether to save the city or not. Now we know, historically looking back, Zedekiah did not, and the city was destroyed. Jeremiah was right. What would have happened? What would have history been written? What would have taken place if Zedekiah had surrendered to God and thus had the boldness and the faith and the courage to surrender to the king of Babylon? He would have been spared. 
Jeremiah is promising the city would have been spared. I don't know what God would have done and put some other king in in place of him. Something would have happened. It would have sustained the city somehow and the devastation wouldn't have taken place. And Solomon's temple might have been able to remain until the coming of the Messiah. All history and all prophecy would have been different. All of it laying on the shoulders of one person. And King Zedekiah wouldn't even have had this opportunity, this one-on-one -on -one with Jeremiah, if it wasn't for one person. Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, who had been made a eunuch, stepping forward by faith. Someone nobody, as all of us are. And yet God can use all of us to influence and have an effect so that one person can make a decision that can change history one way or the other. We think our influence, we don't have any influence, we don't have any impact on this world. What can we do? Who are we? But we can talk to somebody. And that influence might eventually get to a point of putting someone in a position that can radically change history for a lot of people in a lot of ways. In this situation, it was one person to one person. And we might be in a position to do that as well. A letter to someone in influence, prayers for someone in influence, witnessing to someone, and we don't know who that person knows who down the line. God calls us to be faithful. And our faithfulness can impact the world for good. Zedekiah said, let no one know these words, and you shall not die. If the princes hear that I talked with you, and they say to you, declare what you and the king said, we will not put you to death, you shall say, I made my request before the king that he would not make me return to the Jonathan's house to die there. So the king says, don't tell him about the part, you know, I, you know just tell him that you didn't want to be put back in the dungeon. Don't tell him the part about me asking what God has to say to you. That part, leave out. Just give him this part of our conversation. All the princes came to Jeremiah, so somehow they heard that a conversation took place. They had the, the drones going out there and the cameras all over the place, you know. And they told them, according to all these words that the king had commanded, so they stopped speaking with him, for the conversation had not been heard. So Jeremiah obeyed the king. He just told him the part of the conversation about not getting put back in the dungeon. He didn't mention about the rest of it, that to surrender to Babylon and it'll go well. And so they gave up speaking to him. They asked him, they interrogated him for a while. And then left him. Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison until the day Jerusalem was taken. So he was brought bread, he was in a prison, not in the dungeon. The king fulfilled his promise to Jeremiah, but the city was taken. The king did not act. He delayed, he put it off, he refused to step forward and receive the advice. There's a lot of sincere people who want to come and hear. There's a lot of sincere people who come and read the Bible. But it's one thing to hear the word of the Lord and to read the word of the Lord, and it's another thing to obey the word of the Lord. It's not enough to know. Zedekiah went down to his grave knowing what the Lord God said through Jeremiah. But he did not obey. Again, it takes a transformation. It's not in his own strength. It's not in our own strength that we can start following God. It's only in surrendering to the Messiah and receiving his Holy Spirit that empowers us to obey. The king did not do that. And the city was given over. Sad. So he's servant to self, servant to fears, and he ends up dying and the city gets down, thrown down. What about the other servant? What happens to ebed Malik? We go to the next chapter, chapter 39, verse 16. The Lord of hosts says, the God of Israel, to Jeremiah, go speak to Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian. 
I will bring my words upon this city for adversity, and they shall be performed before you. But I will deliver you. You will not be given to those whom you are afraid, because you put your trust in me. So God promised, so God knew uh, Ebed-Melech was experiencing some fear. He was afraid. These four princes and others, no doubt, had seen what he did for Jeremiah, and they weren't happy about it. And so he's now fearing for his life. Very real fear. And God heard his fears. God cared about him. God loved him. And God sent a message specifically through Jeremiah to go to Ebed-Melech. With encouraging words. Because you trusted in me. So Ebed-Melech is accepted into the family of God because he trusted in God. And every one of us can follow in those footsteps, trusting in the Lord and surrendering our fears. And God will save our souls. The tale of two kings. So I'm thankful for an Ebed Melech, an African whom God used in protecting Jeremiah and saving Jeremiah and sparing Jeremiah's life. That he was able to live through the destruction of Jerusalem and continue living on after that. We have others faithfully like that as well. We have the Queen of Sheba, who came to Solomon, also from Ethiopia, and heard the word of the Lord, and it impacted her life. We have another Ethiopian, an Ethiopian treasure, who also somehow or another had been made a eunuch for some reason, but who loved the Lord, and he came to Jerusalem to hear the word of the Lord was reading the Bible, was reading the scriptures, was reading Isaiah chapter 53 and wondering who did this apply to? And God sends Philip to go and speak with him and lay out the prophecy regarding the Messiah, pointing to the Messiah. And that Ethiopian treasurer believes in the word of the Lord as well, accepts by faith and is immersed into the truth and takes the message back to Ethiopia with him. Another African came to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. And Yeshua is bearing his weight. He'd been gone before the court, before Pilate and before um, Caiaphas and was sentenced to death and was carrying the weight carrying the wood to his execution, similarly like Isaac carrying the wood up to Mount Moriah. He's carrying the wood, and under the weight of the wood, and under the weight of not having eaten since the Passover meal, almost 24 hours, and after being beaten, and whipped, and bleeding, and now dehydrated, and kept awake all night long, going from one court hearing to another court hearing. From one beating to another beating. And then forced through the streets, the rough streets, hard stone, cobblestone, up and down the hills. He falls under the weight. One of the soldiers grabs an African man and commands him to carry the wood to Calvary where, he'd be, where the Messiah would be killed, where Yeshua would be killed. And God used him to carry his weight, to carry the Messiah's burden. And as God uses us in ministering to others, we're ministering to the Lord. What we've done to the least of these, we've done unto God. And here this man had the privilege of having carry the weight for Yeshua. And as we move forward in faith, trusting in the Lord, God can use us as well. So we have three, four examples there of Africans in the Bible stepping forward and becoming part of the family of God in faith and believing. And there are many people today as well, many from Africa and all parts of the world, from Korea, and 
Philippines, in all parts of the world, God's bringing a family together, Jews and Gentiles together. Unfortunately, today there are some that don't as well. Some that who should. There are many Jews who stood with Martin Luther King Jr., marched with him. And yet, unfortunately, today, and yet there's many, again, many who do love the Lord and, and, and favorable towards the Jews, Jewish people and the cause. But there are many who don't. There's Louis Farrakhan, an African Muslim who's just totally, horribly anti-Semitic. Has a newsletter he publishes and puts out and speaks in places and calls the Jewish people apes and pigs and all kinds of horrible things and blames all the troubles of the world. There's even a joke of two uh, Jewish men sitting on a bench. Both of them are reading. And one's reading uh, just a regular newspaper and the other's reading one of Farrakhan's newsletters. And the one Jew's reading the newspaper, he says, why are you reading that trash? He says, this is not trash, this is good stuff. For what are you reading? And the guy says, well, here, it says there's a war here and, and there's uh, economic crisis here, and there was a murder here, and there's a theft that took place here, and, and all this stuff. And the other guy says, see, you got all bad news. I'm reading all good news. Look, it says here, the Jews control the banks, the Jews control Hollywood, the Jews control the government, the Jews control everything. See, it's all good news. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff he prints. All these conspiracy theories that control everything and ruling everything and the, the problems of everything. But not only that one individual, he is spoken with and, and praised by Jeremiah Wright, who was the minister of the previous president, President Obama. That church, Jeremiah Wright's church, voted Farrakhan Man of the Year. There's a picture with President Obama prior to becoming president with Louis Farrakhan. That picture was taken, again, before the election. And yet it was suppressed until just very recently. The person who took the picture knew what kind of effect it would have on the election, so he hid the picture and did not show it until just recently, over eight, nine years later. People of the Black Caucus in Congress, I wonder what people would think if they had a Jewish caucus. But whatever, there's a Black Caucus, and the Black Caucus has openly met with Farrakhan and hasn't denounced it, hasn't recanted of it hasn't denounced his sayings. That's sad. The Black Lives Movement, there were many Jewish people who wanted to march with them, and they were told they couldn't. They couldn't hold up their banner and Israeli flags. Just recently, there were two black people who went to a Starbucks in Pennsylvania, and um, and they were told that uh, they wanted to use the bathroom or whatever, but they weren't purchasing anything. So they were told they needed to leave. They weren't going to purchase something. And uh, they said they weren't going to leave. You can call the police and whatever. So the police were called. Uh, and even though that's been Starbucks, I understand that their, their policy was anyway. And even a police officer had gone into, I think, that same exact uh, branch and had, was asked to leave because he, he wasn't uh, buying anything. Uh, and so anyway, as a result of that, Men were arrested and it's become a whole big thing. Starbucks is going to be closing their stores for a day or half day or something like that and having sensitivity training so that their employees won't be prejudiced against anyone and how to deal with it. All the stores, all the stores throughout North America, or at least the United States, can be closed for that day so they can have this training. Well, part of that training that Starbucks has was they invited the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, to come and speak as well. So if we're going to have this day of cultural training so that no, there's no prejudice against any groups, we will bring all groups in, and all groups can share, and ADL's been around for decades, and so they have a lot of experience in this, so they can give us some good training. The other group said to Starbucks, no, we don't want them there. It was Starbucks who initiated it. It was Starbucks who said, we're going to close the store. It was a Starbucks initiative to even have this cultural training. But these other groups said, we do not want them there. 
And they put so much pressure on Starbucks that Starbucks withdrew their invitation to the ADL. So it's not really interested in cultural training and not being any kind of prejudice, because there's still a deep-seated hatred in some people against Jewish people. And that's sad. And that's very sad in society today. We need more Ebed Melechs. We need more Queen of Sheba's. We need more like the Ethiopian treasure. We need more like, and I forget his name, his name mentioned above? Simon, Simon is serene, thank you. Simons, who will stand by the Lord and join part of the family of God. God's calling us to stand together for his kingdom's sake and to influence this world for good. And so as we pray tonight, we decide who we're going to serve. We're going to serve the king of kings or serve self, serve fears. God's impressing your heart tonight. And maybe there's someone that God's calling you to speak out for or some evil that God's speaking, calling you to speak out against in love. As Eva Malik did with humility and Jeremiah. God's calling us to speak. God's impressing that upon your mind and heart. Let us ask God to remove all the fears, remove all the obstacles, and to go before us and to soften the person's heart and mind. And whether they receive it like, or, or don't, like Zedekiah, King Zedekiah did, that's not up to us. Our job is to give the message with love. And so let's pray, if that applies to you. In a moment when we pray, uh, ask God to give you the boldness to speak and, and the love to do it, to transform our hearts. If you're experiencing some real fears, some real fears out there that if you take another step in following God, there might be very real negative consequences. There might be some people that would make very unhappy. I want you to surrender those fears to the Lord and follow God and save your soul. And those around you as well. Zedekiah would have made the right choice. His family wouldn't have had to suffer the way they did. If we follow God, we can very well protect our family as well. Sometimes we think we're doing them a service by going along with them. When God calls us to step out in faith and to follow him and to help protect them as well. So too, if that's your situation, may God grant you the grace to surrender all to him and to follow him. If you're put in a position right now of making some decision, like King Zedekiah, God's taking you to the next step. There's some area that God's calling you to follow him, some area to surrender. I encourage you to do so in a moment when we pray, to give all to him, to let God work, to let God work mightily in your behalf. If any of those areas apply to you, or something else that God's speaking to your heart and mind about. As we pray, let us God use us. And whatever it means, maybe you've been fearing you don't have the resources. Maybe you just have some rags. Let God turn those rags into something that can really help those in need. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we praise your name. And we are thankful for faithful people like Ebed Melech. His name is written in heaven, even if we don't know it here. His name is written in your record books. Thank you for faithful people like Jeremiah. Lord, make us that as well. May we not only want to hear your truth, but give us the power to follow your truth. We want to surrender all to you. We want you to go before us in using us, in ministering to others, impacting this world, and having our lives transformed in the process as well. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.